So last time what we had seen was a statistical model for linear regression, which is of this type where uh, some values x i are the control variable or the input variable or the independent variable and given, given values of those x i, the values y i take on a value alpha plus beta x i plus some error term. The relationship of y and x is approximately linear given by this alpha plus beta x i, but there is some, some error because of random causes. So, if, if we plot a data paired, paired sets of data y, y and x, then we, we may be able to observe some sort of linear relationship and the first task of these linear regression models is to calibrate this type of regression equation where values of alpha and beta have to be uh, determined. The problem is that because of these error terms which you do not know, I mean you do not know the, uh, so the, these error terms E i are assumed to be mean 0 and uh, variance sigma square. So, you do not know those, you, you do not know that variance. So, what you observe are values of x i's and y i's. So, you can pretend that given x i value y i is as per this and we want to find the best value of alpha and beta which will fit this, fit this equation. So, so what we do is we take the criterion of minimizing the sum of squared errors. So, given x i, y i minus alpha plus beta x i is the error term because the, the e i is assumed to be mean 0, so that you can remove. So, this is the uh, pictorial representation that there is a line alpha plus beta x i underlying line alpha plus beta x i superimposed that on that are some error terms. So, alpha is the y intercept in this uh, in this diagram and beta is the slope of this line. So, that is what has been determined. So, if the relationship between y and y and x is exactly linear then it all values y i will lie on this straight line alpha plus beta x i, but because of this error term each of the for a given x i the, the value y i will be some normally distributed random variable with mean alpha plus beta x i. Is that okay? So, it could be a little more than alpha plus beta x i or a little less than alpha plus beta x i and the variance is sigma square. So, that is what we actually observe. So, given all those values that we observe, we have to fit uh, a linear uh, expression. So, so, that is one way of looking at it which is more in the uh, spirit of curve fitting. There is a statistical basis on the basis of, I mean on the uh, principle of uh, maximum likelihood estimators which is also given in Ross's book which you can see. In the case of normally distributed errors, these two estimates of the regression line, the so called regression line turn out to be the same. That is the least squares error criterion and the maximum likelihood estimate of this, of this line alpha and plus beta x i they turn out to be the same. So, we, we have derived this line alpha plus beta x i that means estimates a and b of alpha and beta using the principle of least square errors. Okay. So, the way that goes is you, you look at the observed value which is y i minus the predicted value as per the regression equation alpha plus beta x i. So, if you fit values a and b for alpha and beta then the predicted value is a plus b x i. So, the difference in the predicted value and the observed value is y i minus a i minus y i minus a minus b x i, some of the squares of all these errors because you want to penalize both positive and negative deviations from this uh, set, I mean from this uh, value. So, the values of a and b obtained by minimizing this expression as a, as a function of a and b, they are called least square estimators of a and b of, of alpha and b. So, in this sum of square error term we had seen that the, the x i values and the corresponding y i values they are known, this gives you a quadratic expression in a and b it can be minimized sum of I mean uh, two, two linear equations in two variables. So, actually these are linear expressions in uh, a and b, I mean it is a it's sort of it is a quadratic expression in a and b. If you set derivatives partial derivatives with respect to a and b equal to 0, you get two linear equations in a and b which you can solve. Those are called the normal equations 1 and 2 in this uh, in this slide, they can be solved and you, you get uh, these. So, the point is that for, for given values of x i, because 
the the error term ei is a normal random variable with mean 0 and and uh, variance sigma square b is which has the y y terms so in this in this expression for b let's say the xi values are all known okay so in in the summation each xi is known x bar which is the sum of summation of xi divided by n if there are n n observations that is also known and the denominator is also known xi minus x bar square that's like the variance of of the xi is treated so it's like the standard deviation square so you, you treat treat the xi treat the xi values not as random variables but just as a set of values which you observe that has got a standard deviation so that is the term there but for given values of xi the yi's are all random variables right each each yi is equal to alpha plus beta xi plus ei square so for for given values of uh, xi these are random variables so actually this b b is a sum of normal random variables so actually b b is uh, b is itself a, a a random variable so it has got some some mean and variance and distribution so it, it can be shown that the expected value of of a is actually alpha the, the parameter that we are trying to estimate and the expected value of b is actually beta the, the parameter that we are trying to estimate so the the expressions for a and b if we treat xi as known and and yi is a random variable then a and b are random variables with expectations equal to alpha and beta so you can treat the whole set of observations that you see as outcomes of an experiment if the underlying model is y is equal to alpha plus beta xi plus plus ei then for a given xi the yi is a random variable because it is uh, it has got this ei term and that is what you observe so for a, for a given set of values you, you compute this so it's an instance of the random variable it's like before you toss a before you toss a coin uh, be, before you throw a die the outcome is a random variable with values 1 2 3 4 5 6 with probabilities 1 6 each after you throw the die the outcome is either 1 2 3 4 or 5 or 6 it's a it's a known thing so here in when you when you compute when you compute b as per this expression for given xi and observed yi it is like the realization of a random variable is that okay but before you do it what you observe yi is is a random function of xi because of the error term so it has got a certain expectation it has got a certain variance and so on right so supposing i i think of um, supposing i think of doing a regression analysis of a large population of uh, people where i look at height versus weight now this is clearly a, a, i mean an example where uh, these are characteristics of of a certain population it would be difficult to argue that you know height height causes weight or weight causes height uh, that that would be a bit uh, stretching the thing maybe there is some common genetic characteristic which causes both height and weight so so that that may be but in any case we we are able to observe two attributes of the population so we are trying to see if there is any relationship between height and weight of of an individual so if we sample several individuals we get we get several readings okay so now the question is uh, if this is sort of common sensical that the taller the person the the heavier he or she may be but you know you have all seen tall thin people and and short fat people and also some short thin people and tall fat people and and several medium people and all those things right so you will you will see a scatter but if you if you just look at the cloud of points or on a two dimensional uh, graph of the attributes you can say that there is some sort of correlation so actually if you uh, if you compute the correlation coefficient between height and weight i believe it's approximately 0.4 or something like that so it is it is positively correlated that means you expect a taller person to be heavier but it's not that you know if the if 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 there are two people and one person is twice as tall as the other person then she is going to be twice as heavy as the other person so it's not like a linear relationship or something it is it's got some correlation but it's not 
it's not exact and in any case the for a, for a given height you you see a certain spread of weight so if you if you take any any height like uh, like this height whatever it is you you see that there is a spread so for given height of uh, whatever you see that there are some some light people and some heavier people so you, you see a certain spread because of the randomness inherent in the evolution i mean the, the growth of living beings okay so so what we want to uh, so we can do the following thing we can uh, plot this in such a way that the units of height are uh, uh, in in some units say centimeters but the scale is such that one standard deviation of the height unit is equal to one standard deviation of the weight unit in uh, at least on this page so if i you know if i if i move 1 cm on this page it corresponds to some number of standard deviations of the height parameter and same thing on the weight parameter so then the i plot a 45 degree standard deviation line which says so there will be a certain mean there will be a certain mean height right and there will be people who are one standard deviation more than the mean height means people who are taller than average by one standard deviation and people who are heavier than average on one standard deviation so that line will be a 45 degree line is that okay you got what i'm trying to do so this is the standard deviation line which says this is the mean height this is the mean weight of the population that i'm observing and this is the point corresponding to mean height plus one standard deviation and mean weight plus one standard deviation and this is the line corresponding to mean weight minus one standard deviation and so on so plus minus k sigma for different values of k that line will be a 45 degree line as because of the scaling of the x axis and the y axis is that okay that's what i've just schematically represented here now the question which we want is the following that given given a certain height guess i mean given a certain height what is the average weight of the person okay so given given a certain height so let's say I, I, i mean in centimeters i, I don't know. what is what is the average height which uh, people have you think i mean what's your height in centimeters i mean does anyone know their average height that does anyone know their height in centimeters 170 okay so let's say supposing that's the average height okay of this this population so and the the standard deviation of this group is something let's say 10 cm okay we can com compute the standard deviation so we plot th this thing which is the 45 degree line is 170 plus 10 10 cm on the x axis and the average weight maybe whatever 62 kilos or whatever it may be is on the y axis and it has got a standard deviation of let's say 4 kilos so we can plot plot that thing so now the the question is if i give a height like 180 cm what is the average weight of people who are 180 cm tall okay so there will be a certain spread so if i take so this is say so somewhere here the, in the in the midpoint of this range is say 170 this is 180 so i would i would have a certain range okay so what is the average of people in this range similarly for people here what is the average of people in this range so what you will see the typical sort of could typically be shaped like you know the american football like thing right something like a, a ellipse ellipse like thing you know uh, and uh, so what you would see is that if i if i take a band here and i ask what is the average of average weight of such people then you would see that if i go by this line that is likely to be an underestimate and if i go by i mean if i if i'm that is if i'm below the mean height then if i go by this line then that would be a slight underestimate and if i go to the right of this that means if i look at the average height of people in a certain band here average weight of certain people in a certain band here then that would be a slight overestimate so actually if you if you if you go so see your your looking at every person has got a discrete value of height or weight you know 
So if I if I ask what is the average height, average weight of a person who is 180 kilos, then you know I I, I round it off and I, I say say I, I I create a small vertical strip of people who are approximately 180 kilos, say plus minus 0.5 kilos, round it off to the nearest kilo, and there will be some people in that band, right? So what is the average weight of such people? So if I plot that curve, that will be some straight, I mean that will, you know, because of the nature of this curve, that will be, I mean because of the nature of this data, that will be, it will be something like this. So the regression line is actually a smooth version of this line. Okay. So so what what comes out if you if you look at this uh, scatter plot type of data, it it actually you can you can see it that the the regression line actually will be something like uh, See, if, if I see data like this, then I suspect that there is a linear relationship. That means as one increases, the other increases, on average. So I mean, I may have some outlier here and here and things like that, or here, but on average, this is the cloud of, of data. But if I look at, so this is the 45 degree line. If I look at this strip, the average of these people is, is likely to be above this line, right? If I look at this strip, the average of these people is likely to be below this line. So actually the regression line is something like this. Okay. So if you look at a set of data and if you sort of sketch these type of uh, data and, and look at scatter plots of uh, related things, you will see that the, the regression line is, is going to be something like this. And in, in the case of... Uh, Correlation equals 0, correlation equals 1, and correlation equals minus 1. You can see that this is the case. But for other values, uh, it, so this, this uh, so, so the actual statement is something like this. Let me, let me just go back to, to this for a minute. So this is the typical shape of linearly related data, that you have the American football type cluster data. That is what we typically see. So if we plot the line of x plus k, sigma x, that is the standard deviation of the x variable, and y plus k sigma y, then you call this the standard deviation line. So if you scale it properly, then that will be a 45 degree line, just for convenience. Okay? This will pass through the center of the data. This will pass through the x bar, y bar point. Okay? Because that's k equal to 0, so you can, you can see that. So can we use this line to predict the average value of y given, a given x? Okay, so what you see is that when the correlation is positive, that this average for y lies above the standard deviation line uh, for x, uh, when x is below the standard deviation, so for x, k, sigma below the standard deviation, the average value of y will be above the standard deviation line, and for when x is above the standard deviation, the average value of y will be below the standard deviation. Okay? So, so this is what was observed. So this, this this term, so there was this scientist Francis Galton who's, who is responsible for this term regression. So this term regression, it actually means to go back to. Okay? So uh, if you just look at the English meaning of regress, it is to go back to. So wh wh why is this term used in the context of curve fitting or statistical analysis of correlated data? So he conducted an, a, a series of observations, measurements of father's height versus son's height. Okay? So in the sample that he had, this thing, and I think he took quite a few, many hundreds of uh, observations, and this is the summary of what he apparently concluded. This is the average height of fathers around 68 inches, average height of sons was around 69 inches. So you know, in one generation there was a, some small increase in the in the height because of better nutrition, whatever, whatever, whatever was the condition in that society. The standard deviation for both was around 27, 2.7 inches, and the correlation coefficient was positive, 0.5, which means that on average, taller fathers have taller sons because of genetics, maybe. Okay, but it's not. But the but the key point was that fathers who were k sigma, in this case sigma f, that is the standard deviation of the fathers' heights, 
and the standard deviation of the sun's height. So, both same. So, sigma f is equal to sigma s. But fathers, yeah, this is what I am talking about. So, the average height of fathers was 68 inches, average height of sons was 69 inches. For both, the standard deviation is approximately 2.7 inches and the correlation coefficient was 0.5. So, the, the scatter plot data of this for many hundreds was, was, was uh, gathered and, and computed and in this cloud of data, this person saw that there is some sort of linear relationship. I mean, he, he hypothesized that it is, it is useful to have a linear relationship as an explanation between the two because it is simple to, to explain, simple to manipulate and so on. And so, from this type of data, it, 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 it shows that taller fathers on average have taller taller sons, but fathers who are k sigma, so let us say fathers who are sigma above the mean, so the mean is 68 inches and so fathers who are approximately 70.7 inches, that means who are taller than the mean by one sigma, their sons were, were not you know one sigma taller than their mean their sons were only r times taller than the mean and similarly for shorter if 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 a father was one standard deviation below if if a set of fathers was one one standard deviation below the mean height for fathers the sons were shorter on average but they were not as short as as the fathers relatively speaking so they were only r times shorter than the mean of the, their population, the sun's population. In this case, you know, the standard deviation for both is the same because you are measuring height only and the standard deviation did not, did not change too much from generation to generation. The average height changed a little bit, but the standard deviation did not change. So, in this case, you can actually uh, 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 sort of relate it, but even if any other thing was measured, like supposing you are me measuring height versus weight and so, the, the, the right way to think about it is that if I look at correlated values of any any paired data, the regression equation shows that if if the x variable is say one standard deviation above the mean of the x values, the corresponding y variables, their average will be only r times more than the mean of the y values, where r is the coefficient of correlation. And this coefficient of correlation, you know from, from your earlier these things, it is, it is a number less than 1. It is minus 1 to 1. It, its absolute value is less than 1. So, so what it says is that taller, uh, taller fathers have taller sons, but not as tall as, as, as much taller about their mean as the, as the father. So, so Dalton, Galton sorry, not Dalton. Galton termed this, this uh, phenomenon as regression to mediocrity. So, taller fathers, sons of tall fathers were, were taller than average, but not as much above average as their fathers. And shorter, shorter sons of shorter fathers were also shorter than average, but not as short as, not as much shorter as uh, deviation from the mean as their fathers. So, they tended towards the average. And, and sh taller fathers had sons who tended towards the average. So, Galton termed this term as going back to the mean or he called it regression to mediocrity or something. So, he was some aristocrat or whatever. So, he had some uh, uh, meaning, some sociological type of explanation that society pulls you back to mediocrity or anyway, he called it regression to mediocrity or regression to the mean. Is the is the phenomenon clear? What I'm talking about? So you can read the uh, explanation in in the book also. And so the the other question which we talked about uh, briefly in the last class, which I want to just explain here, is what to regress on what. So we called x as the independent variable and y is the dependent variable. So like supposing we are talking about height and weight data, then what is independent and what is dependent? Actually, both are both are probably dependent on, on some gene or, or environmental factor or, or something on nutrition or 
whatever it is, some combination of some unknown things. We can make, make a guess, but right now we just want to look at the relationship between height and weight. So, we cannot say height causes weight or weight causes height, we can, we can very well regress either on, a, on the other, any one of them we can regress on the other. So, the example of even in the example of uh, linking son's height to father's height, maybe you can say son's height is caused by father's height because of genetics. But you can regress the other way also and there you can certainly not argue that you know uh, uh, the father's height is caused by the son's height, that, that would be a little stretching. Uh, so remember that regression does not imply causality. If if one of the variables in fact causes the other, then we might be tempted to try that relationship first. That means whatever is the causal variable we take as the independent variable and the, the caused variable we take as the dependent variable. But otherwise you can regress anything on anything. Okay? The other reason we may want to regress one variable on the other is that we want to predict that one. So if I want to predict the 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 average weight of a group of people based on height measurements, then I will take y as the independent variable which is high, which is weight and x as the dependent variable, uh, independent variable which is height. So if I want to predict one on the other, then the one which I want to predict I take as the dependent variable. So then I can, but I can, I can do regression either way, I can regress y on x or x on y. So the, if, if we if you follow this argument, then so this is y and this is x, this is the SD line and this is the regression of y on x. It sort of gives you the average values of y for a given x. You can do the other way also and that will be this sort of line. So this will actually give the, the other type of thing. That means I, I will, I, supposing for a given y, I want to find out what is the value of x. Then you will see that this is a better explanation of the, the midpoint of this line than the standard deviation line, which is this one. Is that okay? So you can actually, uh, you, if, you, if you look at this data, so uh, you can, you can uh, look at uh, any typical exercise in, in Ross's book or anywhere else and, and actually try this. You can try regressing y on x and, and x on y. So a suggested exercise is uh, chapters, I mean exercise 7 in chapter 9 which is the chapter on regression in Ross's book. So there, uh, he, so you, you can on any set of regression data you can, you, can, you can construct a regression line for y given x that is called regressing y on x or x on y. So it is actually paired set of data. In, in, in this example as in several other examples, the, the data are clearly sort of two related attributes from the same population. There is no implication of causality. So it is you know that, uh, so you can try both regressions and you can actually, you will get coefficients alpha and beta in both the cases. You can actually think about it and you can derive a simple relationship between what are the relationship between those alpha and beta coefficients that you get in when you regress y on x and x on y. It will be some sort of reciprocals of each other, so you can work it out actually. Okay? So just let me uh, complete this part which is the uh, sort of uh, technical part of it. So this is, all this I will put up, so these are the sections which I would like you to read. So the basic regression model is this, so for, for given xi, yi is a normally distributed random variable with unknown parameters alpha, beta and sigma square. Okay? So now you can, you can think about it as a hypothesis testing, you can give confidence intervals, you can, you can go back to the framework of the statistical. So if you have a statistical model like this, then from the given data you can actually compute all the statistical quantities of interest. So, so sigma square must be estimated from the given, given data and alpha, beta are chosen to minimize some error term. So the distribution, so B, B is the least squares estimator that we have given a formula for B. It is a lean, it is an, 
it is a linear combination of independent normal random variables with expected value beta and variance equal to this. So if you see the variance of B, it is sigma square and just depend on the X values and the N values. So the, so similarly, A is also a normally distributed random variable with, with that mean alpha and the variance of A is that. Okay, so this can be derived. Okay, so uh, the, the, the part that is remaining is uh, the estimate of sigma. So what, what we see is that sigma is, uh, see if sigma is large then what do you expect? That the yi's will be quite scattered around alpha plus beta xi. So if I look at y minus a minus b xi then I, I'll get, that is an estimate of sigma. So the, the sums of squares of residuals, so the residual is for, for fixed value of a and b and xi. I mean, for fixed value of a and b, the, the residual is yi minus a minus b xi. So this term, once I, fix, once I find a and b using those formulas, then this term is an estimate of sigma square. The only thing is, I've used the same expressions for estimating those, those mean values. So I have to divide it by n minus 2, okay? So the sums of squares of residuals divided by n minus 2 is actually, turns out to be an unbiased estimator of sigma square, which is the, the variance of the error term. Okay. So this also can be, uh, can be derived. So in summary, A which is got from that formula, actually the, the, the mathematics of it from the normal equations, those two normal equations, linear equations got by setting derivatives of the error terms equal to 0 with respect to A and B, the unknown parameters, turn out to be such that you first compute B and based on that you compute A. Okay. But it's all a function of the data Y, Y and X. And if you treat x as given and y as a random variable given that x, then this is also a random variable. And what you observe is a realization of the random variable. Okay. So in summary, A is an unbiased estimator of alpha, B is an unbiased estimator of beta. What are A and B? They are from the quantities derived from the normal equations. And the sums of squares of residuals, so once A and B are determined, then the sums of squares of residuals, this SSR, that divided by n minus 2 is an unbiased estimator of sigma square. Okay? So that is the basic summary of the regression, uh, linear regression model and the associated statistics. So in fact, we know the variances of these things also. So we can actually give confidence intervals for these a and b and things like that. So you know, we can, we can write a regression equation for anything this, because this, this, these formulas are there. These formulae are there. So you can write, you can construct a regression equation for, for anything. But how good is it for prediction? You know, so if I if I use it for prediction, then I, I will I will get an estimate, but the, the spread of that estimate may be quite large. It might be quite it might be so large that it is almost useful uh, almost useless to uh, predict. So that depends on the data, data, of course. So you can compute those those confidence intervals for associated predictions. So yeah, just to uh, complete this thing, the notation is uh, you know if you if you write it in this uh, sort of covariance like term SXY and the variance term SXX is standard deviation square and SYY, then we can actually do inference about regression. So for example, one of the first questions you would ask is, is the, is the dependent variable really correlated with the independent variable? You know, I see this cloud, does it really mean anything or is it just, you know, X and Y are just moving around randomly. I mean, they are just independent random parameters. So is there really a connection? So the hypothesis is, is, is beta equal to 0? If beta is equal to 0, then Y is just alpha plus some noise. Whatever X is, Y is, so you know, I, I, I may just have some, some values which are, uh, you, you know, just noise terms. You know, if I just see a, a, a just a, some values like this. So there is no, there is nothing, uh, I mean, if I, if I tell you that X is this value, then Y has got a certain spread. If I tell you X is this value, then Y has got a certain spread, which seems almost the same as this. So I don't get any more information about the likely values of Y if I tell you what X is, and maybe vice versa also. So in this case, there is no relationship between X and Y. So if I plot a linear regression, then, you know, I'm going to get a line like this. This is the best fit. So beta is equal to 0, slope is equal to 0, okay. So 
so that is one of the fundamental uh, you know hypothesis regarding regression that is is beta equal to is beta equal to 0 so we can pose this question in the language of hypothesis testing and take that as a null hypothesis and we can sort of work it through it turns out that i mean just going through the same whatever i said about the parameters b and the estimates of those things so actually it turns out that this quantity here uh, which which seems complicated but basically it is i mean the ma the main thing to note is that it it is something that is explicitly computable so square root of s x x s x x is the standard deviation of the x values b minus beta beta is in this case zero so that is the hypothesis divided by sigma so sigma is estimated uh, by that uh, so this quantity has uh, and divide by the denominator which is also a known quantity once you uh, uh, compute it so this quantity treated as a random variable has a t distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom so fr from the from the regression data if we treat xi as random variables one can construct a new random variable this one it looks complicated but it's it's a function of the known parameters which has a known distribution so using that known distribution we know what what values it can take with what probabilities so we can test hypothesis see in hypothesis testing what we did was to answer the questions of our interest we found a known a, a known random variable with with a given distribution so that will have certain properties and so therefore it can take on extreme values only with a small probability so then we are we are able to put type 1 errors type 2 errors level of significance okay so because of the randomness it is possible that this random variable can take on some extreme values you know like very large values or very small values but that's very unlikely very unlikely so we put a bound on 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 this this value and if it lies in a certain interval then we can we come to some conclusion about the hypothesis if it lies outside then we reject this this hypothesis so that's that's what we do here so if h not is true that is the null hypothesis that beta is equal to 0 then this random variable is a t distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom so then that gives rise to this test so compute this this quantity n minus 2 sxx divided by sr square root of that times absolute value of b so given the data this left hand side in this test can be computed and on the right hand side you have the the the, the critical region of the test which is t distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom and if gamma is the level of significance then gamma by 2 and if this test statistic is outside that then we reject the null hypothesis otherwise we accept it so it's the same logic as before only the expressions are a little complicated but it can be i mean so i would not expect you to derive this or something it it's actually quite straight forward it follows the same logic as before and it it just deals with normal random variables and t t distribution so this this can be derived so the point is that there is a well defined statistical test for accepting or rejecting the hypothesis that there is a relationship between the input and output variables okay okay uh, last thing which i would like to say is uh, i think this is the last one yeah that uh, there is a uh, there is a value called the r square value which is used in uh, regression models which is the extent of fit so see i can i can have regression i can plot regression values for anything i can plot regression values for uh, supposing these are the values then you know my regression line is like this yeah i can if i look at these two cases in this case increasing x values indicate increasing y value in both cases correlation is is positive in this case increasing x value explains the variation in the y value it says the y value increases and to a very great extent the explanation is fully captured by the x variable in this case or let let me just exaggerate it a little bit in this case 
also if I if I increase the x value the y value also increases, but the increase in y value is not explained by the increase in x value to that extent. So, obviously you know there is a coefficient of determination which uh, I mean this is a better regression fit than this right. So, what is the what is the quantitative way of saying that? So, it is the it is the the deviation sums of squares of deviation of the y values with respect to its mean minus the sum of squares of errors of the residual and divide by the I mean just to get a standardized quantity that is called the r square value. So, this r square value you can show is is between 0 and 1. So, if this if this r square value is, is high close to 1 then we say that the regression fit is good. So, the coefficient of determination is good. Okay, so, this is just a quantitative test for how well the the, the, the regression line explains the data, it, no, no causality and all that, how, how well does it explain the data. Okay, so, basically, so y, y increases as x increases, but how much of the increase of y is explained by increase of x? This r square value will tell you that, it is a value between 0 and 1 that, that can be shown. A, a, so, this r square value is between 0 and 1, a value close to 1 indicates that the regression model provides a good explanation for the variability in the y values. A value close to 0 indicates that the model does not really explain the variability in y, I mean the x values. Uh, so, uh, th this r square actually it is uh, in, in the example of the father and son heights business, this r square value is 0 0.961 which is quite good. So, of course, the the square. I mean, uh, you would you would suspect that this r square has something to do with the correlation coefficient r. If I just view, so forget about this random variable business. If I just look at a set of values, say say heights, and a set of values, say weights, as just independent data sets, and if I compute the correlation between these two sets of data, then I get the correlation coefficient r that is actually the square root of this r square. Only the sign has to be appropriately put because uh, you know it could be positively correlated or negatively correlated. For convenience this r square value is the sort of square of that. So, it, it so correlation coefficient r is between minus 1 and 1 and this r square value is square of that. So, it is between 0 and 1 high value of r square indicates good fit of the regression model and low value of r square indicates that the regression model is not a very good one. Okay. So, of course, there are many caveats uh, uh, this this r is the, the the standard coefficient of correlation. So, it is the square root of r square actually. So, except for the sign indicating whether it is a positive correlation or negative correlation, the sample correlation coefficient is equal to the square root of the coefficient of determination. And the sign of r if you want to sort of derive it from the data it is the same as that of b that slope coefficient you know we have we have we have calibrated the regression model as y is equal to a plus b x. So, if b is positive it means a positive correlation if b is negative it means a negative correlation. So, that that the sign of r is the same as that of b and the value of r is the is the square root of r square ok. So, now where should you use this regression model well whenever you see data like this. Whenever you see data like this, you can use a regression model. If you see data like this, regression model is very great and probably somebody has cooked up the data. This is very too good to be true, but you can use the regression model. This one is, is also seems ok. But if I see data like this, you know then I, I would be a bit foolish to use a linear regression model to explain the relationship of y and x right. It is not linear. I mean it is clearly not linear it is some nice quadratic or something like that. So, linear regression model is, is not really useful, but you know the thing is that you can you can still do it. What will you get if you if you if you use a linear regression model here well you will get some line like this. I mean it th this this is the best fit straight line fitting this data. So, that is not very useful. So, for high values of x and for low values of x I mean it, it just says that you know the values of y are clustered around this in some way, 
So, it does not tell you the, the, the qualitative nature of this behavior is that for some low values of x and for some high values of x, the values of y dip down and there is an interval. So, it is a it is a it is a quadratic relationship. The regression model will not be able to capture that. Although technically you can you can do this and you can compute r square and you can compute a and b and all that, you will probably get a, a low value of r square, which should warn you that this thing. But the, the point is that when you are using these models in, 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 in practice, please plot the data and look at it first before doing anything. Please plot it and look at it. So, later on if you use regression models anywhere, the first step is to plot the data and, and have a look. Because you can always put all this data in spreadsheets and so, so, uh, you know uh, software and, and get, get some coefficients and uh, keep on doing it. But you should not lose the basic sense of what, what is it that you are trying to do. Is that okay? So, all this data analysis and all that is fine, but uh, please do not discard your common sense. If something does not agree with your common sense, chances are you know something is wrong. So, please take a look at it. In a few cases your intuition may be wrong, but it is definitely worth a look. So, do not disregard your common sense. No matter what the software tells you or the program tells you or whatever it tells you, do not disregard your common sense. So, no matter how many marks you get in this course or do not get in this course, one thing which you have with you is your common sense, do not lose it. Okay.